Higher Universe Pictures. Welcome to the Paranormal Phenomena Podcast with Brandon Rhinus and Elizabeth Chamberlain. I'm Brandon Rhinus. And I'm Elizabeth Chamberlain. Welcome to the Paranormal Phenomena Podcast, where we talk about ghosts, aliens, and the unexplained. On today's show, we welcome back paranormal expert Morgan Knudsen to talk about paranormal hoaxes. If you like our podcast, be sure to subscribe, and we'd love it if you could like, share, and comment on our show. Those likes go a long way in helping us reach a wider audience, and we really appreciate that. Hi, Elizabeth. So I'm glad that we're doing yet another show. I'm also very glad. These are so fun! I know. Usually we, um, I know the first couple we we would chat a bit at the beginning, but then lately we kind of just immediately jump right into the the, the interviews um, with Morgan, so it's... Uh, we just, I just wanted a chance to talk because we have something very exciting going on. Um, yes, I know maybe we do. You want to, to announce it? Well, I'm sure most people have heard about it, so it might not be a first announcement, but we are um, shooting grotesque. The pandemic tried to stop it, but we're going to finish what we started. Yeah, we, um, we are very ambitious. We only have enough money to shoot uh, for five days at this point, but we don't want to have to wait because we got up here in Canada, we have winter coming and we don't want to have to push the shoot until next spring. So we decided to just start shooting and then um, between a crowdfunding campaign and hopefully the buzz we can generate while shooting, we'll get enough money to uh, finish it, which is kind of what happened with Hotbox and it was successful. So uh I'm pretty pumped. It's been a long time. I think it's been a year since we've, uh, at least since I've shot anything, uh, since we've yeah, worked same. together. Yeah. So it's, um, it's going to be, take some getting used to, but it's exciting. You know, that we're, we're into heavy pre-production and it's kind of like after a year of doing not a hell of a lot, it's kind of exciting to, to, uh, just be back at it again. And we've been getting extremely good, um, like feedback just about the movie uh, people seem excited about it and rightly so I think it's going to be freaking amazing and uh, I'm really looking forward to starting to shoot I'm, I'm looking forward to it too I think people get excited about good scripts and 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 good talent and good people um, coming together and I, I think we have all of that so I think it's we don't we don't have anything that's not worth getting excited over it's it's worth it a hundred percent Absolutely. So anyone listening, keep your eye out. Our, our horror movie called Grotesque begins shooting in September. So check out our um, Facebook and Instagram pages and you can see what it's all about. So I guess now we should get into our show. We have Morgan Knutson on yet again, and we have a very interesting topic to discuss. Yes, we do. We are talking about hoaxers. I love Morgan. I am so excited to hear what she has to say about this. All right, let's jump into it. Hello, Morgan. Welcome back to the show once again. Oh, it's always good to be here, you guys. And I like tonight's topic, I think, is, is really cool. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, so on today's show, uh, we're discussing something that is one of the main points that's frequently bought, uh, brought up by skeptics of the paranormal as a way to uh, explain away the phenomena, and that is hoaxers. Um, basically, people think the entire thing is a lie, or at least specific incidences of it. Um, however, there are instances of genuine hoaxes, and uh, that's what we're going to discuss today. So I guess the, the first question would be, why would a person create a paranormal hoax and how common are these hoaxes? Well, it's, it's a really, really good question because like, like you were saying, this is something that comes up a lot. It's kind of the go-to uh, sometimes excuse uh, for, for skeptics. It's the go-to answer for a lot of people. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a, a number of reasons and I think we have to sort of go back to some basics in psychology. And, and I think the question becomes, why do people lie? Why is it that people lie? And I think there's seven main points that, that I've come across over the years and that I know psychologists have talked about as well. Um, and you know, sometimes you get people that you know, they're trying to take what's not theirs. Um, they're trying to escape accountability. Um, they're trying to avoid punishment, that kind of thing. Um, but I think in the case of, of paranormal hoaxes, um, you're looking sometimes at a, a group of people that, or, or a person who 
is living, maybe living in a sort of a fantasy experience or fantasy life. They want to create something that they don't have in their world. Um, and sometimes that can create a false self, uh, sense of self-esteem moving forward. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll fake it for those reasons. Uh, sometimes it's, it's malicious. Sometimes it's to, uh, you know, cause pain or gossip or, uh, you know, create a stigma about something. Um, but oftentimes when, when we dig into stuff like this, sometimes it's just a seeking of admiration. You know, it's like, I've, I shot Bigfoot or I, um, you know, I've got this haunting and it makes me special because my house is haunted. Nobody else's house in the family is haunted. My house is haunted. Um, so I, I think there's like, there's a number of different reasons. And depending on the case, uh, you could, you can kind of, you can kind of start to piece together, you know, what the people's motivation are, it, it really is. It seems like there could be different types of hoaxes. Like some could be they don't do it maliciously. They think their house is haunted. It's not. It's something completely different. And then there's claiming that you saw a Bigfoot when you did not. Um, there's like, you know, Photoshopping evidence. Um, there's, there's that kind of thing. So I guess there's two sides. So one being malicious and one being not. And there's probably two different types of people that would partake in each of those, those activities. Well, exactly. And I, and I think that's why you kind of have to break down the, the motivation of why the lie is occurring to begin with. Um, you know, are they doing it to gain an advantage and to exploit other people? Are they that kind of a person? Or is it something where, you know, it's making them feel a certain way? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I mean, I've had cases, I've had loads of cases where, uh, you know, I've gone into to businesses or homes or and whatnot, and debunked things that are going on. And the people just don't know, like, they've, they've experienced something that they just don't know. And so their go to is, okay, this was paranormal. But I think, I think for me, like, when I think about hoaxers, I think more along the lines of people who are, um, are, are deliberate about what they're doing. It's planned, it's premeditated for whatever reason, whether it just be for a laugh or whether it be for um, do, just to see if they can do it, um, you know, or, or maybe it is, is a malicious thing, but I, I do, I think it comes back to, you know, why, why is the person lying? What's, what's going on? So how can you tell, how, how do you tell if it's a, if it's a hoax or if it's real? Well, usually the red flags are there, at least with a haunting, very, very early. Um, when you're talking with with somebody, uh, people who are are in trouble or they're, um, you know, af afraid of what's going on, they react very differently to somebody who they're who's seeking uh, attention for what's going on. So, in an interview, for instance, uh, you know, if you've got somebody who is who is say you know wanting that attention or wanting that validation they're very very eager to tell you about the place being haunted you know they, they're not really concerned necessarily about the event but they're more concerned about um you know the fact that they want you to see it they want you know other people to see it they're inviting their friends and family to see it um it's a very different energy than when somebody's coming to you and going look uh I don't know what's going on in my house. Sometimes there's a shame or embarrassment around it. Um, you know, somebody who's genuine, they're, they're concerned about what's happening. There's a, there's a very, very different energy behind them. And the more, the more people like this that I've interviewed, you can really see uh, a, a lack of enthusiasm towards uh, get it, actually getting an answer with the people who are hoaxing it. They, they want you to come and, and validate it and, and tell you that, tell them that it's real and tell them this is going on in their life. But when you broach them with a solution, then sometimes they'll get angry. Sometimes they'll get offended by it. Sometimes they'll like, they don't want that because it's, it's destroying that fantasy. So there's a number of things that you can kind of pick apart when you're, you're dealing at least with, with in the, in the haunting field. So are these people like, is it like a mental kind of illness of some sort to do that? Or are they, it just seems like that's a, it just seems like a very odd thing to do, right? You know, things like stealing money, like if you're doing it for financial gain, it's wrong, but I can understand that motivation, but just to do it for a fantasy, it seems uh, that's not a not normal thing. Yeah, well, and, and it's funny because I've had more of those than I have people scamming for things like money and things like that. Hmm. Um, the, the majority of people that I find uh, that sort of attempt to, to create a story like this usually are, there, there, are, there are a certain type of, there are a certain personality type, they have certain character flaws, um, but they're also, they're also people who are maybe not feeling uh, like they've got a strong sense of identity, a strong sense of self, 
Um, oftentimes they very much wrapped their identity up in the idea of the haunting or that they are haunted or that they are psychic or um, it's something along those lines where they have, they have worked it into their self image. And that's why when you turn around and you say, look, I think it's actually the plumbing or I think it's actually, uh, you know, you've mistaken A, B, C, and D for this. Uh, you know, you end up with with people who will get really angry at you, even though you're bringing the solution to them, that you're they get really angry. And it's because sometimes what they will do is is that they will wrap their identity up in it. So I think when when you've got people who are or at least often when they are when they are deliberately creating this, sometimes they just get to the point where they're just either so identified with it or they're believing it now themselves. Uh, so yeah, like there's, there's definitely some, some personality flaws with, with some people that, that do this. Do you think that there are people who are not necessarily hoaxers, but are still excited when they get haunted? Like, I just feel like I could totally be mistaken for a hoaxer because if I actually got haunted and I, and I like called you, I'd be like, Morgan, this is so cool. You have to come check this out, but like, yeah. I wouldn't be, you know, putting it on. Totally. totally. And, and, and that's, again, it's, it's a very different energy. Like, I think if, you know, if, if, you, if you're, you're passionate about it, you're excited about it, cause, cause you're like me, I love it too. I, I think it's just the coolest thing. I've got a, a client actually right now in, in NISCU who is the same way. Like she texts me every time something happens. It's just so neat. Uh, and, and, and I, I completely agree that, but I think, I think there's a difference between having a passion for it and, you know, feeling like you've had a negative experience and then reaching out for help and then having that enthusiasm about being victimized by something. And that's usually where I see the, 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 the um. if, so if I'm, if I'm dealing with somebody who's turning around and saying, you know, look, I really need assistance. I really need help. And then you get there and they're like, either like, oh my God, look at this. And oh my God, look at that. And you, you got to see this. And it's like, hold on though. Like, you know, you're, you're asking for help. You're asking for a solution. You're not taking the solution, but mm -hmm. they're very enthusiastic about the, what they're experiencing. Um, you know, and usually, usually that, that interview will go along with, uh, certain statements like, you know, I'm the only one in, I'm either the only one in my family that is, is like this, or they will uh, be associated with, um, you know, oh, my, my entire family is just, is just cursed. Um, this is just what happens. Um, like very much, they, they very much sort of center themselves in this, this victim state uh, where with like people like you and I, we're just bloody passionate and excited. About <laughs> so it's, it's just, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah it's, a, it's a different energy. Do you ever have, is it always, or usually like uh, individual people doing this, or do you ever have a couple or a family or a, like a group of people perpetrating a hoax, or is it usually just one person? Usually in haunting cases, what I've found is that it's, it, it tends to be either like, well, a, a case that I'm thinking of specifically, actually, um, I've had it where there's been one person and then the family has become the enabler for the person. Uh, so there's a couple of different, different ways that this seems to happen where you've got, you know, in, in the case that I'm thinking of, I had a family member who was in complete belief that this is what was happening. She had completely wound it into her identity. Um, this is what happens to me. This is what is happening to me. This is why I'm special. Um, and then you've got the rest of the family who might kind of know that they're not really telling the truth, but they've also learned to back off and to turn around and say, oh, no, no, just let her have her thing because she's, she's created this. And if you, you get into conflict with it, then it's not worth it. So they're, they're trying to keep the peace. Um, in a lot of business settings and stuff like that, if there's going to be a hoax in and around a business, um, usually, at, usually it's the, the, like the managerial staff that are kind of in on it. They're the ones that want to keep this, keep whatever it is going. Um, in the UK, there was a, a, an investigator who I used to work with. Um, he ran into it where they were trying to bill a hotel as haunted. And what they would do is they, they had, they had tricks all over the hotel. Like they had a mirror that had a picture on it which they drew in, in this very light glue on the back of the mirror. And so when you took the photograph of this mirror, you'd see a face in the mirror. <laughs> so they had deliberately set this up. Like it was, it was really interesting. And uh, so in, in case, so in cases like that, usually you've got like the management or the owners that are, that are aware and they might not tell the staff because they don't want the staff to give it away. 
so again, it, it sort of comes back to, to our original discussion about why are they lying? What are they doing? Why are they lying? What is it? And then that sort of creates the dynamic as to how many people are actually roped in and involved. And I can, I can almost see, I mean, it is, I think it's wrong to lie about that. Is there something, something not right about it, but I can kind of see that and it doesn't seem as malicious, you know, I mean, even, you know, the Loch Ness, you know, they make a lot of money off of their, the tourism there. So they'll, even though there's may or may not be a Loch Ness monster there or hasn't been seen in a long time, we'll kind of have this ongoing thing where, you know, you can go out in a boat with sonar and see, you know, they, they really have to keep this whole thing going that maybe it's there just because they, you know, they have a lot of money riding on it. So I could see that, but I mean, claiming a, a hotel's haunted is one thing, but actually faking stuff like that, that seems pretty, uh, that seems pretty low. Yeah, and I mean, and there's, it's it's such an old profession, basically, to be able to hoax this, you know, in one of our last interviews, we talked about Houdini busting these, these, you know, these sort of spiritist uh, mediums and things like that during that, that during that, those eras. And, you know, when we look at things like uh, the Minnesota Iceman, for example, the Minnesota Iceman was a, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a circus, a, a, the circus show sideshow that people would come in and and go and, and think they were looking at a, a bigfoot or a yeti under ice and you know when the guy was challenged about it all of a sudden boom this disappeared the like the the, the body disappeared and it was replaced by what they they deem as a replica because there was legal consequences that were bleeding into this whole problem uh you know if the guy's carrying around a dead body then obviously there's legal repercussions <laughs> so um, that all of a sudden it got replaced by this this replica and uh, the body the, uh, the original body disappeared so they you know so I mean but he made a mint I mean taking this all around the country and saying this was the Minnesota Iceman and this is you know possibly a Bigfoot under ice and whatnot and then my, when my friend Ken Gerhard went to to examine the replica which is still in existence um, he found that the replica had, like nothing to do at all with the the uh, uh, what was shown in the original photograph so the first one so I, you know, I think people have made money off of this stuff for decades. One reason witnesses of the paranormal are accused of making it up is financial gain, but there is really large sums of money going to people who claim to have witnessed paranormal events. Are there? Are there really large sums of money going to people who have claimed to witness them? I have not heard that. Um, as far as I know, you know, there's there's been lots of contests and things like that that have been put out. Um, people like James Randi and whatnot that have all put out award rewards saying, you know, if you've seen this or you can do this or whatever, you know, you'll get a million bucks. Um, but as far as I know, um, and like there's there's been no financial awards for people that have experienced things. Of course, there's always been controversy going back and forth about, uh, you know, people that have supposedly made money off of it, such as the Lutz family with the Amityville Horror, um, you know, oh, well, they got book royalties or they got this or they got that. Um, but as far as I know, there's there's really been no, there's been no financial gain on the part of, of some award coming down or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even the parapsychology departments, I think, you know, they're still waiting for their funding. <laughs> yeah. the people are experiencing this stuff. I just hear, you know, you always hear um, people that claim to witness things and the skeptics will say, oh, like they're just in it for the money. Yeah. But it's like, well, what money? Like you claim your house is haunted, like you don't get a check from the government. <laughs> like, I don't, like, where's this money coming from? I mean, even if you made a YouTube video about it, maybe you'll get a bunch of views up but these people are not making <laughs> more than they would getting a job you know so oh, i don't i just have a hard time believing that no and and i mean there, there there just isn't the money that i think that people think there is in this field there, there just isn't like unless you are landing you know a major network deal or something like that there you're not getting paid for this stuff and and ultimately you know i think what what a lot of these skeptics and whatnot don't understand is the fact that these these, you know, being able to come forward and be vulnerable about this stuff usually lands people in more trouble than they, they actually, uh, they intended to begin with. So coming mm -hmm. forward, you know, opens them up to criticism, it op opens them up to scrutiny, it opens them up to the media and people's like, terrible comments on Facebook and, you know, all sorts of things. So I, I you know, I don't really, I don't understand that either, that whole idea that, you know, oh, they're in it for cash, Wherever this money is, I don't know where it is. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so how do you how do you prove something's a hoax? It seems like 
proving that it's fake would almost be as hard as proving it's real. Like, you know, there's been ongoing debates for years over the Amityville and other things, whether or not it's real. So especially something in the past, it's how do you, how do you prove that it's, it's a hoax? I think there's a number of ways. I mean, you know, basically if, if I'm doing an investigation, for instance, I can go through the, you know, like the, the normal steps of an investigation. And usually, you know, if you're good at what you do, you, you start to come across things that don't line up. Um, sometimes you'll start hearing in interviews, you'll hear stories changing. Um, you know, we're pretty diligent about looking at the environment. So turning around and, and you know, examining the things that are moving and shifting and, and whatnot and listening to the people when they're telling you what's going on. You know, we're always listening with a, like a lot of ears. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not just these ones, it's, it's a bunch of them. And, you know, we're, we're really, we're really paying attention to what's being said and what's not being said when, when we're interviewing these, these individuals. So usually you can, you can come across what's going on pretty quickly. Most hoaxes are not that good. Like they're really not that good. Um, so you're know, looking back on this stuff, you know, sometimes the technology that we have now, uh, for example, for, you know, past hoaxes will we'll start to reveal what's actually going on. Um, but, you know, it, it is just a matter of deduction. And, you know, as I say, usually these people, they're, they're just not that great at it. <laughs> so you, you can you can start to debunk it relatively easily. So what do you do if you're if you're helping a client and then all of a sudden you suspect it's a hoax? Like, how do you confront them or or do you or what do you do? Well, sometimes what you can do is you, you kind of have to assume that they they don't know, like because most don't know. <laughs> really, they usually don't. You know, they they're usually coming to you going, I I don't understand what's happened here. I I don't get it. So usually you can take that approach. You can just say, okay, look, here's here's what we discovered. Here's what it is. You know, here's the natural explanation for this, and and let them run with it. Um, I fortunately I've never been in the position where I've had to say, okay, you you've literally faked this. Um, there's been a couple of photographs that have come in over over the years, but through other people uh, that have been blatantly ghost apps, uh, things like that for your phone that are going to put these ghostly images in in photographs and and things like that. Where you can say, no, no, this is actually an app you know, don't fall for this. This is actually an app, but hoaxers usually don't come to me <laughs> with their hoaxes, which is probably smart. Yes, uh, you that's know, a good they, idea. I would. Yeah, they, usually, they usually don't. Like, they're, they're usually trying to fit, fool the general public they're, or their neighbor or their, you know, friends or whatever. They're not usually trying to fool investigators because they know. They know that the majority of investigators will, if they're worth their salt, they're going to see right through it. Mm -hmm. So has, um, you kind of touched on this before, but has the, the perception of paranormal, paranormal activity changed in recent years? Like in past decades, you mentioned that people were kind of more embarrassed to have witnessed things. Nowadays, you know, there's TV shows and, and social media, so people may not be so embarrassed about it. They can just upload it to YouTube, post it on Facebook or whatever. So do you find that the number of hoaxes is increasing or has it kind of stayed the same over the years? Yeah, I, I think with the technology that we're getting, I think, you know, the, the, I don't think the hoaxing necessarily is getting more, more prolific, but it's definitely becoming more easier. It's becoming easier to do uh, because we, we do have things like apps and Photoshop and, and all of this different stuff. But ultimately, I don't think it's necessarily getting worse. Um, if anything, I think the evidence for the paranormal is actually becoming, uh, becoming, uh, a little bit more prolific. It's becoming uh, more scientifically based because a lot of these cameras and tools and whatnot are becoming more available to people. So I don't think it's necessarily that these, like the, the hoaxers necessarily are, are suddenly coming out in droves, um, but there has been more video evidence brought forward from all of these different paranormal worlds, everything from hauntings to cryptids to UFOs, to all, you know, all of these things. So I don't think it's necessarily that, you know, we're, we're gaining more hoaxers. Um, it's just the hoaxing has become a little bit easier and it just keeps changing platforms. You know, sometimes, you know, it, of course it used to be these, you know, seances and in, in these uh, Victorian houses that that are you know they're taking photographs of ectoplasm and now it's you know a ghost app on Photoshop that's putting some screaming figure mm -hmm. in the background. Yeah, I know back in the fifties, you know they could 
throw a hubcap in the air, take a picture of it and claim it's a UFO when that tricked a bunch of people. There's a bunch of those. It seems like it's a much more, it's easier to do now. And that's why, you know, when I come across these things on social media, it's just, I have a hard time believing anything. It's like, you know, that's a cool picture, but it could be so yeah. easily faked and I wouldn't know how to distinguish a fake one from a real one. So I, I have to approach everything at, you know, with a grain of salt in that it's a possible hoax. Oh, you have to. And, and I think, and I think it's wise to approach it that way, you know, but, um, and, and especially too, a lot of, a lot of hoaxes that have been circulated, at least the ones that have been become more popular, like the Dybbuk box or Slender Man or anything like that, start on the internet and then they allow the internet to just explode with them. They let people carry the hoax for themselves, which is something that we did not have, you know, a, a number of decades ago, 20 years ago, you couldn't set something loose on the internet. You know, it was either word of mouth or it was a photograph or something like that. But now, you know, we've got these items like the, the Dybbuk, which was, you know, originally put on eBay uh, and sold as this, you know, haunted, haunted box um, that, just it was actually just recently that the the fellow who started it came forward and said no 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 this was actually like I I wrote this I created this story um and it was the same thing with Slenderman where you know it started off as a sort of pop culture internet phenomenon and all of a sudden you've got people saying oh my god I've seen Slenderman so it's it's really interesting because we're living now in a world where that kind of a, a rumor or that kind of a hoax can circulate so easily and then people grab it and then spin it into their own tail. So you've kind of got a you've got sort of the central hoaxer, but then you've got sort of all these other hoaxers that kind of branch off of <laughs> branch off of these stories, which is which is kind of interesting too. So if it's easier nowadays, do you think it's also maybe more successful? Like, have you come across anything that's tricked you or that has tricked somebody that you know that ends up being a hoax? I haven't myself fallen for anything yet. But I mean, yeah, like, I, well, I mean, I, I look back on, on some of the things just you know, over, over the more recent years, like in the last 10 years that people have, have really jumped on board with like the balloon boy. I don't know if you guys remember the balloon boy that was in 2000, was 2009, um, where the parents were saying like their kid got carried off by this balloon and there was a surge party out and there was like, there was all of this going on. It was crazy mm. it was all over the news. And then it came back that no, this didn't happen. Like these parents completely made it up. There was no balloon boy. There was nothing. And it was, it was just, I think it blew people's minds. Like it was a little crazy, because, but yeah. I remember everybody sitting around watching this. And I, I wasn't invested enough to know whether it was sort of true or not true or whatever, but I remember hearing about it and, you know, not thinking, well, that's kind of like, yeah, it was weird, but you know, it wasn't like, oh my God, these people are faking it. It, it, it yeah. was kind of beyond our scope of reasoning. I think that you'd have parents fake something like this. Um, and, and I think that's a part of it as well and why these hoaxes do so well is the fact that most people don't think like this <laughs> you know like you and I don't sit here and think to ourselves how do we gain the impression of the of, of the press how do we gain their attention oh I know what we'll do we'll just fake a missing child and we'll oh. call the police and the media like we don't think like that right so no. there's you know, so people, you know, they, they hear this stuff and they think, well, you know, well, you know, they're telling the truth or maybe they're telling the truth. It's almost like, you know, these people that pop up in the news once in a while for faking that they had cancer and they'll, they'll shave their head and, you know, just gen gen not so much money, but even just sympathy, just yeah. all these people sympathize. And then it turns out, you know, that they made the whole thing up and then, you know, then they're in all sorts of legal trouble. It's a, uh, it takes yeah. a specific kind of person to do that. And yeah, I, it's yeah, not, I, I just don't even understand that kind of logic. Like that is uh, yeah. Well, and, and that's where that's where like at the beginning we were talking about you know that idea of either um, you know stealing admiration or exploiting other people and, and things like that. And I think at that point, especially with things like the you know like faking faking cancer or um, even faking, say for example, the idea that you're belabored by some horrible entity and you're you're you know, trying to pull people in to give you help and things like that. I think you're really leaning into the, the category of vulnerable narcissism, where you've got somebody who is, is so desperate for attention that they're, they're creating all of these different problems. And it doesn't matter what lengths they have to go to in order to get it. It's almost like a Munchausen's where, you know, it's, it, they will, 
they will put themselves on display to these eg egregious levels in order to to you know grab that attention it's 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 a that's a whole nother level so to get into a slightly different area i guess would be self-proclaimed psychics and people who claim to talk to the dead and charge money for it i suppose it comes down to whether or not you a person believes in that kind of thing but those are industries that could easily be faked and they're charging money for it so like would you consider that a hoax yeah i mean i think i think it runs a very fine line and again with with psychics you you have them in a bunch of different categories because you've got the people who are are genuine that they're they're really really good. Um, you know, the, a lot of the people that are certified, for example, by the Winbridge Institute or the Forever Family Foundation or these these really reputable organizations uh, that really do the work, they're no joke. I mean, these these people are are some of the the best of the best. But you get these other group, you get the other group of people who, for example, like we were talking about before, they believe. They believe that they're psychic. They believe this. And really what they're picking up on is cold reading cues. They're picking up on subtle facial expressions or micro expressions and things like that. And they believe that that's, that's psychic ability. And, and, and they really believe what they can do, but they're, they're full of it. And um, then you've got the people who are at the other end of the spectrum who are deliberately lying. They're hot reading, cold reading, warm reading, whichever you want to pick. And they're deliberately creating a business in order to make money off of these individuals that are, are suffering. And to me, you know, there's, I know there's the argument that, okay, you know, they're, they're bringing closure to certain people or things like that. But in, for me, I see it as, as clearly taking advantage of individuals and, and uh, you know, where you, you can go to a place like the Forever Family Foundation, you know, you're not going to be faced with a bill later. <laughs> um, and so I don't think that I, I yeah, I, I for myself, I see that as 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 hoaxing and, and probably one of the most egregious forms of hoaxing. Oh, yeah, we can we can end it there. The, we're running out of time. So that was a very interesting conversation. And, yeah, uh, this subject is fascinating to me because <laughs> it, it really is about the psychology of why people do what they do. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for coming on the show again, and we will have you back next week where we will be talking about the occult and government. Yay! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you later, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to the Paranormal Phenomena Podcast. See you next time.